Now we get into another problematic internal element in your own daily battle for integration that also relates to your future eternal state, part of the kingship training. And this is this is also just about as annoying and painful as recognizing that you always have to, as a ruler, um, deal with loss. Every decision you make involves a loss, and you have to accept that. The, the basic point of that last increment was that as a ruler, even though you're the ruler, see, all the power, all the, you know, status, all the everything, there's no way to make a decision that isn't going to result in loss. Even God. Okay? God is deciding truth be free. That means there's a loss. And he has to live with it. So when you make a decision, you have to take into account, like the Lord said, count the cost. And the genius of God, and frankly, from what I can tell, the reason he's willing to be God is that he wants the cost. That's a loss to him. And then there's the other loss to him that, you know, he really doesn't want, but it's part of truth be free. And that's the loss of whoever won't believe in his son. That's something he never wants. Second Peter 3 9. God is never willing. This is the way it should be translated. Never willing that anyone should perish. And perish has two meanings. I mean, perish in the sense of, you know, lost. And perish in the sense of forever, you know, in the lake of fire. It doesn't have to be forever, but God foreknows it will be. Satan's never going to change his mind. I don't know about those other angels, but chances are, no. I mean, you don't see in, what was it, Revelation... 20 verses 11 through 15 is this great white throne judgment where all the unbelievers, you know, are resurrected. And they stand right there now before Christ. They can't pretend that there's no God. They can't pretend that they don't know what the story is. And because God is never willing, Second Peter 3, 9, why aren't they standing there saying, whoopsie, we blew it. I believe now. But they don't. There's nothing there. There's two books. Books of life and books of works. Their names are blotted out. ex Catalapo or ex Catalapo. Their names are blotted out of the book of life because they never believed. Their names were originally in the book of life. And had they died so young, before they were able to say no, they would have been in heaven. But God let them live to have the freedom to say no, knowing they would. And they used that freedom to continually say no. So they never believed. So they go to hell. And they're standing there, blotted out of the book of life. So it's kind of like, okay, the book of life doesn't have your name in it. Well, let's add up your works. And my pastor, when he covered this passage, would say, okay, there's John McGillicuddy, and he has 3,223 million point three works. The point three he shared with two other people. Yeah, okay, but all those human righteousnesses cannot even begin to add up to divine righteousness that you get for believing in Christ. So guess what? You and your works get thrown into hell. And that's what Second Peter 3 is about. That's actually used to create the lake of fire. Go look it up. It's in Second Peter 3. And then by the time he gets to verse 11, he uses one of my favorite words, huparkane. He says, what sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to life, to God lifestyle? In light of the fiery end. 
Oh well, here we're talking about loss. In light of the fiery end, which what must you become? You got to become acclimated to the to the loss. You got to become acclimated to the cost. That was last increment. Took me a while to summarize. Okay, now in this increment, there's something else you got to become acclimated to, and it's in its own way another loss, another cost. Oh, I hate this part. I really do. You have to be a role model. This is why the Bible talks about doing good. It's the only way it talks about it. But you have to actually read the passages in context to understand that. When Paul talks about, you know, don't give occasion to anybody to have anything bad to say about you. Peter says the same thing. I don't remember if John does, but I think he does. Somewhere in 1 John. I'm not really sure you could interpret it that way, but maybe 1 John chapter 2. Okay. I mean, it, the topic comes up is the point. That you should take care how you walk. That admonition isn't there because works are spiritual. They're not. It's there because the world is not spiritual. And to it, doing good is, how do you want to call it, godly. To them, the height of their limited understanding is that if you do visible good deeds in their opinion, then you're godly. And the idea of that is then they will listen to you when you actually talk about something that really is spiritual. Which means that all of us are not only in the divine broadcasting system, we're not merely on divine TV, but we're on human TV. When somebody knows you're a Christian, they are immediately going to expect that you're, how do you want to call it, a good deeder. They're going to expect you to be uptight. They're going to expect you to avoid things like smoking and drinking and swearing and all this other clap trap. The Bible never says it's spiritual. And in fact, there's a lot of swearing in the Bible. Uh, Paul says drink wine. Okay. There's a lot of dancing in the Bible. David danced naked. His wife was really upset about that. I'm not sure how naked naked was, but in her eyes it was naked. In other words, a lot of things that Christians regard as unholy behavior, so too the rest of the world. Because your average Christian is just like the rest of the world. Just as carnal, just as stupid, just as undiscerning. And so what in the eyes of the world is good versus bad is sort of projected onto a known Christian. And you're held to that standard by people. Not by God, but by people. It's kind of like your kids. When you're a parent and you have kids, your kids have certain expectations of mommy and daddy. And if mommy and daddy don't behave the way the kids expect, then the kids are hurt. And, you know, it's kind of trial and error. You learn to figure out what your kids expect. Because you know you're their role model. And, you know, you know you as just a regular human being. But they don't know what that is. You know, you got, you're on a pedestal to them. And so if mommy speaks nasty then something's wrong. Mommy is mean, even though mommy really isn't mean. They don't know the difference between warning and being mean. When you're mean to somebody, it, you're, you're trying to put them down. But you can scold, you can use nasty words, you can be, how do you want to call it, harsh. And there's no intent to put the person down. 
And a lot of times that's what you'll do with your kids. You scold them because you're worried. You scold them because you, you want them to remember, don't do this. You're not putting them down. You love them. But they can't tell that difference. A harsh tone only means bad. The same thing especially with spiritual children. I get that all the time, you know, because I don't, I don't mince words, okay, because that's rude. If you, if you mince words, you are, I remember my dad was telling me this, and I got to use a nasty word because this is the word he used. He says, don't, when you go out or you talk to a guy, don't be what he called a prick teaser. Do not flirt with him. Do not be nice to him. If you don't want him, tell him flat, be direct. Otherwise, he's going to think that you're being coy and you really want him. Be nasty. Be whatever it is that makes it real clear to him, no, I do not want to date you. Okay? That was some of the best advice he gave me. And Okay. Well, I don't want to do that to you either. I don't want to do that to a Christian either. If a thing is wrong, say it's wrong. Do not mince words. Try to explain it because it's stupid to just call somebody out and not explain why. Name calling is fine, but without the reason, then they can't benefit from it. That's what's so sad about Christianity, is that we either call each other names or we get we're overly nice, and then nobody's benefiting. It's real sickness in Christianity. Oh, well, you're not nice, so you're not a real Christian. Honey, you're not a real Christian if you're nice when you shouldn't be. Christ was not nice. I don't understand, what, the people can't read the Bible? The Bible I got, in English, or whatever languages, or the original. He's not nice. When he calls you a whitewashed sepulcher, he's saying that you're a grave on the inside. And you just look nice on the outside because you're a hypocrite. That's not nice. He told the Pharisees that they were bastards. That's not nice. Okay? Paul, in Ephesians 3.8, calls all human work shit. Of course, he's playing on Isaiah 64.6, which says that they're menstrual rags. Those aren't nice statements. Christ says, you are of your father the devil. Is that nice? So where do we get the idea that you're not a good, you're not a real Christian if you're not nice? Christ is obviously a real Christian. He's the Christ who we're supposed to model ourselves after. He's not nice. But you're not, you're not supposed to be nasty for no reason. See, it's supposed to be like talking to kids. Whatever you say to yourself or someone else, it's supposed to be designed to help them. It's supposed to be designed to bless. But you know, blessing can hurt. Now you can say, well, Brain out, how do you know when it's good to be nice and when it's good to be nasty? Well, that's a ruling. That's part of the loss. Whatever decision you make, you're going to incur a loss. Even if it's right to be nasty, it hurts. It hurts to be nasty to somebody. Yeah, you can get carried away with anger or sin or whatever, but it still hurts. Don't you feel sick afterwards? I mean, yeah, you enjoy it too because the sin of anger feels good. But sometimes it's not the sin of anger. And you feel sick. I mean, if you had to go tell your best friend, I don't know, that you can't see them anymore, you're not going to feel good about that. You're going to try to avoid it. But if the person you're not going to see anymore is someone you can't stand, it's going to be easier to say, right? But you're still not going to feel good about it. And you'll sit there and justify it to yourself. Anything to talk yourself into. 
why you should do it or why you did do it or why it was right. Why? Because inside it, there's this like, no, no, no. It's never nice to be nasty. But you got to do it sometimes. That's a loss. The other loss is, oh, crap. I'm a role model? Yeah, to the, to the stupid. You know, when you're around people your own age, you can afford to act real. But when you're around people a lot younger, you have to, you, you know, everybody does it. We all do it. When you're around children, you act differently around children than you act around people your own age. Because you just unconsciously or subconsciously know, oh, I got to, they're expecting to see something. I have to play a game, a role for them. Yeah, you do. You're a teacher, you got students, you got to play a role, even if you're the same age as your students. You're the boss, they're the employee, they're underneath you. That's a role. You know, as a Christian, you got a role. And it's not pleasant. It means like, you know, like I just swore a couple of times. I've been sort of gradually introducing it every once in a while. And the idea is to show that swear words are not unchristian. They're actually in the Bible. Okay. It doesn't mean that I like using them. In fact, I prefer not to. Because I think swearing is kind of ch childish. Okay, it's overdone. And it means that you have a deficient vocabulary. But sometimes it's warranted. Okay, you can say, well, Brena, how do you know when it's a good thing to swear or not? Answer, I don't. It's a judgment call. I have to talk real fast. I'm not sure if the words I'm using are really the best words to use. I'm trusting God to make sense out of it to whoever's going to listen. But, you know, half the time I'm not really sure. Is what I'm saying to you now what God wants me to say? Maybe yes, maybe no. Generally, yes. But often I don't know that until after the fact. You have to guess. you got to make a decision now. Based on two little facts. That's ruling. That's a loss. That's a cost. And you're the role model. And when you screw up, they're going to judge you for it. And that's fine if they judge you for it. The big problem is you don't want them to really be judging God, but they think they're judging you. That's a real serious problem. And I, there's, that's another loss. There's no way around it. Like I often am going around in comments, okay? And a lot of the times I have to say something like vile pro-lifers. Because pro-life is as anti-God as it gets. It's all tied up with anti-Semitism. And the pro-lifers don't even know. I'm not even sure you can become pro-life unless you're anti-Semitic to start with. I mean, you really have to have no brains to be pro-life. Your brains just have to have been fried. Not breathing, not alive. How hard is that to understand? It's all over the Bible. The Bible's definition of life begins with your first independent breath. Are you breathing? Then you're alive. Did you stop breathing? Then you're not alive. Did you never start breathing? Then you're not alive. What is so hard about that? Biologically, there is no breathing in the womb, period. The oxygen is fed to the fetus from the mother. The fetus is not breathing. You can't breathe in water or amniotic fluid, actually. There's no breathing. They say, well, the heart is beating. It's not the fetus that's causing the heart to beat. It's coming from the placenta. It's, it's organic material that is responding to the placenta. It's not independent life. It's not independent breathing. It's not independent beating. It's not independent anything. It's attached inside somebody else. To say that the fetus is human is like saying, let's see, what? 
your chromosomes inside your fingers are human. You say, well, chromosomes aren't human. Right, and neither are the body parts inside a womb. There are chromosomes that multiply and turn into, you know, blastocyst and embryo and all the rest of it. It's just a factory, which is exactly what David calls it in Psalm 139, but they don't translate it properly. See my no womb life dot HDM. Go look at the Hebrew. They're body parts. David is amazed that body parts the guy would even bother to order, literally. Order like, you know, you go to a catalog and you order for purchase something to buy. God orders the body parts to be made. That's how David's treating it. Those are the verbs he's using. He's amazed that God would even bother to do that. Wouldn't you? Why would God bother to take the time to even care okay that's a lost question you're spending time and effort and blah blah okay now we're talking time and effort being a role model and part of that role model is that you have to call a spade a spade if you don't what do you want to call it discipline your children they're going to be hurt for life. Now, you don't have a parental role over other believers unless you're a pastor. And even then, it's limited. But like a big brother or a big sister, once you're known as a Christian, especially to other Christians who are younger than you and non-Christians, they're going to look up to you. They'll snot at you, they'll lie to you, they'll say all kinds of things to insult you, but, and you can usually tell right in their words the way they do it, but they pay a lot of attention, and they want you to talk to them. The worst thing you can do is say, I don't want to talk to you anymore. They want you to talk to them, because underneath it all, they admire They want to have a relationship with you. But they don't, they, they can't handle that too. So they have to be hostile. This is really true the most with atheists. They can't stop talking. The minute you get into a conversation with an atheist, getting out is almost impossible. Okay, they, they don't want to stop the conversation. They have a hate-love relationship with Christians. Okay? They just got to get, pick, grab at you, grab at you, grab at you, grab at you. And it's not really hostile, but they'll play it that way. Because they don't know what else to do. I'm not, I'm not, they're attracted. There's something subliminal that they know, you're a role model, you're higher. And they like it and they don't like it all at the same time. And they need to like shoot at you. And part of them is hoping to knock you down. And the other part of them is hoping that you will like vindicate your faith to them. They're always asking you to prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it. Well, part of them really wants you to give them enough proof so they can believe too. They're attracted to that. That's a classic example of the role model thing that Paul's talking about, how you walk, how you present yourself. Peter did a lot of talking about that too. So the loss is you're not your own. It's one thing to be living your life before God. It's like being naked, okay? It's like you're with your spouse and you're naked. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing your spouse doesn't know. So you don't have to pretend. You don't have a role to play. You can, but you don't have to. That's ideal marriage anyway. 
But with the outside world, it doesn't work like that. With the outside world, it's all protocols and customs and baloney, diplomacy. And that was going to be my career, and I'm so glad I, got, I didn't. It, it, there's, there's, there's just so many little ways everything goes wrong with relationships with people on the outside. Where there's no intimacy or very little or restricted intimacy. And that's the way it is with the Christian and the rest of the world. They're constantly holding you to their standards. And the whole problem is that the Christian way of life is nothing like their standards. By their standards, God is immoral. Even God. I don't know if you listen to them very much. But in a, maybe you've maybe in your earlier life you had this problem or you have it now to the world at large the whole idea of some guy magically coming down and being God and human at the same time like what does that mean and somehow magically hanging on some wood and magically thereby paying for sins is like oh yeah sell me the Brooklyn Bridge it doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't. You have to, the Bible goes in, you know, the whole Bible is dedicated to explaining why this is, why this got done. Why it's the right answer, why you can prove it, and all the rest of it. And I see total proof of it every time I walk out the door. But that didn't used to be true. I believed because I knew it was true, but I didn't understand it. I knew God was, you know, I knew God wanted me to believe in Christ or not be saved. I knew it was true. That's it. And it was very disturbing, in my case, to believe it. But I knew for sure I had to. That's pretty much the testimony of anybody. Maybe it wasn't disturbing. But you know, you know you got it from God, you know this is the thing, you know you got to do it, and you believe or you don't. But you do just know. At the same time, they do just know that if you're a believer in Christ, you got the answers. Now you don't really have the answers, but relative to them you do. So the people in your periphery, you might, compared to some other Christian, have, you know, enough doctrine to fill a thimble. But compared to the people in your periphery, you're genius. Because God deploys you that way. And they know you're higher than them. He's like advertising you to them. And they'll bug you. And they'll have these expectations of how you ought to behave. And you're like, hey, wait a minute. I'm not a role model. I'm just another human being. Sorry. And you can say, well, that's unfair. Yeah, it is. That's the point. It was unfair the way Christ was treated. It's unfair the way you'll be treated. It's unfair that they don't even bother to try to understand what ought to be good news. Hi, Christ paid for your sins on the cross. Believe in your saved. That's good news. It's simple. It's easy. It doesn't cost you anything. He loves you. He paid the cost. What's bad about that? Nothing. Is it hard to understand? Does it seem too good to be true? Yeah. But, you know, it's good news. And you can say, well, gee, that sounds really good, but I don't understand. Okay. And then you learn about it. But that's not the way people react. What do they react? Oh, that's no good. That's unfair. So th this other definition of God is just as good. Huh? Every other definition of God says you got to work your buns off. And maybe, maybe you'll get credit for it. 
Look at any religion you want, anywhere in history. Even Islam. Islam is constantly saying, believe in Allah, believe in Allah. But that's not all it is. Believe in Allah and do this. Believe in Allah and do that. Believe in Allah and blah, blah, blah. And even when you do all that, unless you kill Christians, you're not sure if you're saved. You're not sure if you're going to go into Islamic heaven, which is really under the earth. Muhammad, famous verse in the Quran, talk to any Muslim you want. Muhammad didn't know if he was saved. Muhammad didn't know. And that's why you got this problem with the jihadists. That's why women strap bombs onto their own kids. Because the one sure way to be saved in the Quran is to kill yourself by killing Jews or Christians. Now how holy does that sound? And where is it like grace? Where's grace in the Quran? Nowhere. You kill yourself for God, basically. And the way you kill yourself for God is you kill a Christian or a Jew. For sure you go to heaven then. With the 72 Horis and all that other nonsense. Contrast that with the Bible. You believe in what God did. And you're saved forever for sure. You sacrifice nothing. Because he sacrificed 2,000 years ago. There couldn't be a more strident difference between the Bible's definition of salvation and every other religion ever in existence. Or any that you could make up. Because all of them say that you got to do something for God. Only the Bible says God did something for you. Do you believe in it? Because it's an offer. It's an inheritance. The Bible calls salvation an inheritance. God did something for you. It cost him. Do you accept the inheritance he wants to give you? Now that's a legal thing. And it's in Ephesians of uh, Hebrews 9. A will. It, it's made analogous to a testator will. And that law has always been on the books. It's true now too. When somebody dies, he makes out, he's made out hopefully before he died, a will as to how, what should be the disposition of his assets. I, Uncle Bob, die. If I die, my wife gets the house, my kids get my car, blah, 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 blah. That's the analogy in Hebrews 9. Christ died on the cross. What do we get for that? What did the testator, meaning Christ, say that we should get? And the big point in the book of Hebrews is, you've got to die before the will can, be, can take place. I want to say that's Hebrews 9.14 or something. Okay? A death having taken place, I think is the exact wording. The will cannot take effect until you die. You know, we all know that term today. Last will and what? Testament. What is the Bible term for that? Hey, kine dia feke, the New Testament. Testament means somebody dies and then their will is, you know, goes into effect. So that's cost. Now, the will of Christ going into effect means it's an inheritance, right? He dies, he says you get X. And you can you are therefore the beneficiary of the will. Okay, well under every law that's ever been in existence, if somebody wills you get something, you still have the right to elect against the will. Elect against the will. That's exactly what you're doing when you turn down the gospel. Anybody who goes to hell elected against the will. 
Because Christ paid for everybody. That's the point of Hebrews 9. And at the end, you know, at the end you have the first um, comes death and then the judgment. You know, no reincarnation. Duh. Alright? You're judged because you elect against the will. Okay, if I elect against the will, then I get the alternative. What's the alternative? Well, you're electing against God. His will, my son paid for your sins. And his will, I want you to believe in that payment. But your will was, well, I don't. Okay. So what has to be the alternative? See the point? Now the world hears that story. And they're pissed off. They don't like the fact he paid and we believe to inherit. They want to go to God like Cain with his vegetables and say, I earned it, I earned it, I earned it. Just like the woman, okay? Okay, woman, you eat this piece of fruit and you're just as smart as God so you can go wave yourself before God and say, I earned credit before you. That's what the world wants. So they judge you in terms of their ideas of credit and they expect you to live up to their ideas of credit okay even though none of that's spiritual and really frankly it's anti-Christ it's anti-God it's their way of waving themselves in front of God and saying I deserve, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve they will not hear anything else So, Christians, of course, buy into that lie just like the rest of the world do. And that's why they never grow up. Because they're constantly living like the rest of the world instead of according to spiritual life in the Bible. And that's why the rest of the world says, well, why be a Christian? It's the same life we already believe in. I can be Baha'i. I can be Muslim. I can be uh, an atheist. And I just do good deeds like the Christians do. See? So they're talking out of two sides of their mouth. On the one hand, they expect you to live up to those standards. And then when you do, it's like, well, then there's no difference I should get into heaven. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So the Bible's kind of got a lot of stuff on that. And the basic idea is, look, don't live your life before God. That's what Paul was talking about. Everything is legal. Not everything is helpful. people that you're around might have certain customs like you know he gave the example of being in Corinth and in those days you know they sacrificed to fake gods and so it didn't mean anything but then what they did with the sacrifice food is to make money on it because you know gods really don't eat food the priests did but the gods didn't because they weren't real so they take the food that was allegedly for the gods and they would actually sell it to the restaurants in the area. And so certain restaurants were known for serving that kind of meat. And there were some Corinthians in the area who were all, you know, really weak-willed or weak in their understanding, twisting their understanding about doctrine because they were childish. They said, well, you're eating food. You're eating meat that's been offered to idols. As if the idols were real when they weren't. And, you know, what do you do with somebody like that? That's like somebody saying, Well, you can't be a good Christian and smoke. Says who? You can't be a good Christian and drink. Says who? Okay? But if they're, what well, Paul's point was, if they're so weak in their doctrinal understanding, then you're faced with a problem. Do you defer to their weakness and therefore not smoke or not eat food off for the idols while you're in their presence? Okay. And Paul is basically saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll abstain. I won't do it. Not in front of them. 
I know I'm free. My conscience is clear. But for their sake, I won't do it. Well, there's a flip side to that cost. Okay? The role model cost there. The flip side is, well, but if you abstain, then aren't you feeding their misunderstanding and sort of reinforcing it? So they will think, well, see, the brain out didn't, wouldn't smoke. You know, I, I know smoking's bad for Christians. And, and maybe brain out smoke, brain out didn't smoke. Pretend I did. I used to, but I don't know. Okay? And brain out didn't smoke. Therefore, it's true. You see, that's the problem of a, of a more mature Christian. Is that if you give into this thing, then you're going to be actually selling false doctrine. And then they never grow up. So what do you do? And the example Paul gave, you know, he's at a restaurant and they're serving food. And he said, don't ask what kind of food it is. Because the food offered to idols was usually really high quality. Okay. So he says, you sit down at a table and they serve you meat. Don't ask. But if somebody who's sitting with you says, oh, that meat was offered to idols. As if idols were real and you'd be bad if you ate it. I said, well, I'll abstain then. Not because it's bad to eat the, the meat. Because idols are nothing. But because this poor person's going to be all bent out of shape. Now, in some situations, I'd do that too. Like, hello, in the example he's given, you're in public. You, you know, you've got two choices. You can either just back off, or you can, like, in public, censure the person who warned you saying, look, don't you know idols are nothing? And then you've really shamed that person in front of everybody. So you lose either way. That's what I meant. The decision you make, you lose. You're either going to lose them or shame them and lose them that way. Which do you do? Well, you can do your, you know, and they say, oh, you shouldn't do that, brother. How many times have you heard that? Well, you can sit there and say, okay, in a manner that, like to everybody else, so they won't feel guilty if they don't go along. Since the person just talking to you, it's just okay. Or something. I'm not 100% sure how well you do it. But obviously there are certain situations where you just, like, go along. So that you don't hurt them. I mean, if I went to Afghanistan, I'd wear a burqa, easily. In fact, I'd like it, because I didn't have to worry about my clothes. But I wouldn't sit there and try to flaunt the Islamic custom of women covering up, at all. I would have no intention of doing that. That doesn't make me less Christian. But a person who, say, is there and doesn't believe in doing that because their faith is so ill-informed, would say, oh, you better not wear a burqa because then that makes you less of a Christian. If I couldn't take the person aside and explain privately, then I'd listen to them and I'd risk whatever might happen to me for not wearing a burqa. Of course, I'm fat and old now, so it doesn't matter, but, you know, so what's your, what's your story? Where do you go with this? You're a role model, that's the point. Everybody's expecting something of you. Because you're Christian. Just like any, you know, movie star walks out of his own house. Just like any politician who, got, who goes out in public. Everybody has expectations of a mother, a, a father, a you know, a, a, an attorney, an accountant, a doctor, we all have expectations and roles. How valuable is that? How right is that to have those expectations? Doesn't matter that they're there. 
It's pain in the neck. Total pain in the neck. And for the Christian, there's nothing you can do that you won't be condemned for. Just get that understood right now. Whatever you do, it won't be right. Whatever you do, you'll be criticized. You can be nice, you'll be criticized. You can be nasty, you'll be criticized. You can be up or right or up or down or short or tall or fat or thin or young or old. It doesn't matter. You're a Christian, you'll be criticized no matter what it is. Just like if you're a politician. There are a lot of good politicians. But they're all criticized. There are a lot of good attorneys. But they're all criticized. Okay? Role model. That's the battle of integration. How do you integrate your real self with the fact that you're a role model and then complicate that by the fact that you really need to be consistent in private and in public? Because it, if you don't learn how to do that, it's, you know, then that means that the role model you have to be out in public, you also have to be in private. So how do you do that? Well, you have to keep reminding yourself who you are. I'm royal family. I'm royal family. I'm royal family. And then it becomes natural to be a role model to yourself when you're alone or private versus being in public. It's not a big shift. Okay? And that's what I think you can argue that Christ is talking about. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, he kept talking about himself in terms of Son of Man. That's Daniel 7.13, the way he's using it there. It's not the typical Son of Man that just refers to a prophet. It's, an, it's a different construction in the Greek. Okay, and of course he's using LXX when he's doing that. So, he's looking at himself in terms of his office. And in 2 Corinthians 5.18, which Gail Ripplinger doesn't understand, Paul omits the word Jesus to stress his office, which is Christos, anointed one. So, if you learn to think of yourself in terms of your office, I'm royal family of God, I'm a king in training. Just like, you know, in your other jobs. Somebody says, well, you know, who are you? You'll say, I'm an attorney. I'm a lawyer. I'm a housekeeper. I'm a this. You're, you're defining yourself in terms of your office. Okay, well, here's an office. You're a king in training under Christ. You're a king in training by the Holy Spirit. You're a king in training for Father to be turned into fit bride. That's who you are. You're the work, not what you do. The work he does in you. That's you. And it's an office. It's also who you are. The idea is to unite. This is the killer part. The idea is to unite the personhood and the office because they're united in God. My pastor stresses so much. Adam was not just created a man. Adam was created a husband. Eve, Isha, her original name, was not just created a woman. She was created a wife. In other words, unity of personhood with nature. Unity of office with nature. God is not merely God nature, but God office. So the whole role model thing really ends up being a training mechanism. I mean, it starts out, you know, ostensibly it's because the world has, you know, what do you want to call it? Soulish expectations of us that are totally unwarranted. Their idea is good deeds, good deeds, good deeds. It's a satanic mindset. Okay, but that engenders a need to be the role model that, frankly, God has turned into the structure for eternity. Because in eternity, you are doing all the good deeds. In eternity, everybody's living off you. You're the king, they live off you, and you wouldn't have it any other way. Parenting. 
forever. So God's kind of turned all this on its head. God person, God office, all one person, all one office, two sides of a coin, the same one. Think about it. 